Welcome to the BWI Live Show. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. We have a fun show for you today. We're going to try and do a couple of different things on the show. Uh, I'm going to be doing two or three things at once. So bear with us today as we try to have a fun, interactive show with you, the audience. What we're going to do is, towards the middle of the show, we're going to play a game where we take a look at our predictions for the 2022 season, and you're going to vote on which prediction you think is your favorite or whichever one you think is right. So kind of like when you're playing a game with your family and you got to read the room, that's what we're going to be doing as far as what the audience likes, what they want to hear, and, of course, what's right. So that's coming up on the show later today. But let's introduce our panel. As always, we have the incomparable Nate Bauer, BWI Senior Editor. Nate, good afternoon. Say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. I, I have a call coming in. I had to unmute myself, <laughs> but I think... I think I'm okay. This is a high oh, wire also, act at the highest level, guys. Wait, one one more thing. There is a four year no, not four year old, three and a half year old, one room away watching television. So pray for me that she doesn't make an appearance. We'll see what happens. <laughs> pray for me. I love that. Dave Ecker doesn't have kids. He has a cat. The cat is put away. And Dave and his lovely refrigerator are with us as well. Dave, good afternoon. How you doing, T Frank? I am doing phenomenal. Thank you very much. I'm excited for the show today. This should be a lot of fun. So let's get into some of the topics before we get to uh, some of the stuff later in the show. And by the way, if you are watching, uh, make sure you like the video and you share with your friends because we want to have audience participation on the show today. And that involves having people here to watch. Uh, so we normally get people in and kind of filter in after the video starts but we want to make sure that we got enough people and have fun today here on the live show so share with your friends tell your co-workers just blow off that meeting in this afternoon and we'll get to the show and we'll have some fun so we're going to be talking about this offseason for Penn State football to start uh, picking the most impactful parts of the offseason so far for Penn State football uh, this is the BWI Roundtable. It's a great place to start here on Monday. So, Dave, let's begin with you. What is the biggest, most impactful storyline or thing that's happened so far this season, according to you? Yeah, um, you know, I'm going with the second option because Nate got first dibs here. So I'm just being different. Let the record show that. Ooh, but, different. Uh, I know. I'm going to go with uh, the lack of, you know, impact inbound transfers. Um, certainly by this point last season or last year, rather, we'd seen, I think, I think almost most, if not all of them had been in by now. Um, and Penn state has one, um, one scholarship transfer, Mitchell Tinsley. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, it seems like again, again, James Franklin kind of came out and said, here's four or five positions where we would like to make additions and it hasn't happened so um certainly there's still time for that to happen but to me looking at the holes on the roster and some of the problems that they had last season um i think that is uh the biggest theme um that i'll pick out now i'm gonna go to you now nate because this was i think and i want to i want to make sure i'm correct here this was your idea so oh, well. You got you got the first pick in the draft here as well. So what is the most impactful thing this offseason so far as you've seen it? Uh, and you know me. I can't just be simple about this and straightforward. But I see a lack of movement in the NIL space as being the most impact. Like it's a it's a it's an absence of impact. And so, and so, uh, in that way, it is the most impactful part of Penn State football right now. It's just that it's it's silence. It's silence from an NIL standpoint, where everyone, not everyone, but you're seeing these major stories start to come across about um, things like collectives, things like uh, Ohio State's athletic department being able to to help facilitate these things and work right like. I mean, there was a story last week about adjusting the rules. So Ohio State adjusted its own protocols to be able to facilitate those things. And there, there is some question and some, some back and forth about 
what Pennsylvania, right, on a state to state level, what is permissible and what isn't. But it, it's just it's a it's a problem now. It has been a problem, and I see it continuing to be a problem that you're, you're just you're not seeing Penn State as part of this conversation at all. And so it doesn't necessarily impact like right now today, but three, four, five years from now, th this is going to be the standard. Um, and Penn State's really not a part of it right now. And I, we got some great questions in the chat as well. I want to make sure that you understand. We're going to be getting those a little bit later. Should have said that to start the show. We'll be, we will have a, a question section coming up in just a little bit. And of course, if you want to donate to the channel, Super Chats are always uh, super appreciated and they help fund the BWI YouTube channel, specifically my job and my job security. So, you know, dancing for our money today. So if you want to do that, that's great. And we'll absolutely answer your question. Yeah, that was a bit awkward. I agree. I shouldn't have done this. Look like a TikTok. Anyway, uh, we'll be getting to those in just a little bit. Nate, you talked about the collective. I yep. want to sit there for a little bit because I find that being very interesting. This is crowdsourcing yep. for NIL. Yep. What did you read about this weekend? I know you posted this in the Lion's Den message forum. So if you're a member, you can go check out the article that Nate's referencing. Uh, what's the future here? And what did you learn about this weekend that you want to share with everybody? Yeah, so uh, Eric Prisball, who is the uh, kind of the, the point man on a national scale for this, uh, really at on three, but also from what I've seen nationally, he's he's kind of the one who's um, who's leading the charge in terms of its, his reporting on it. And he had an interview this past weekend, I think it was Friday, it was released, uh, in which you know it it basically detailed how every Power Five school is going to have this set up, some with the influence of the school, but in a lot of ways not influenced by the school and not influenced by the program, but really just a person or two, whether it's a hyper active alum, a, a former player, what have you, who really kind of heads up, uh, for lack of a better term, a GoFundMe for NIL, <laughs> right? And so what, what the players are doing in return for the money is to be figured out later. Right. It is it is a slush fund. It is a hey, let's collect as many donations as much into this central pot as we possibly can. And then it's there and then you figure out what to do with it after the fact. Um, and so that, you know, I, I think that the fact that Penn State doesn't, at least from my perspective, does not have one at the moment, um, that's not. That's not completely atypical. I think that there are plenty of schools who don't have one right at this second, but there are who who do. And there are more and more and more that are going to have them in the coming weeks and months. And so for Penn State, it becomes essential that it is it enters into that space, right? If, if everyone right. else is doing it. And and like I get the the pushback of, hey, just if everyone jumped off a bridge would you no like you better right <laughs> you, you better like if you don't you're you're going to be missing a, a major ingredient to how the recruiting space in particular moves right. in the in the future that there are multiple ways to slice this right so there are multiple ways for players now to earn money through NIL through their own social media. We have the NIL evaluation, NIL evaluation at on three. And of course, through more traditional means of local companies sponsoring athletes for their advertise for their business. And then this is obviously another avenue. It's not, as you said, if somebody jumped off a bridge with you, it's the race has started. The marathon has started and you're still stretching. You need yep. to make sure that you start running pretty soon. Dave, it Does just because we haven't heard anything about Penn State, do you think that that necessarily means they're not acting or they are, as uh, Nate has talked about, kind of waffling back and forth about what they want to do and how they want to do it? It does seem like there's some waffling going on, doesn't it? Um, yeah, and look, Nate's, Nate's the expert here, but certainly you would have liked to have seen something by now. <laughs> right and even even during the season and i don't want to belittle this i guess but the nil deals that penn state athletes were getting were local 
you know, mom and pop shop NIL deals. And that is what the vast majority of, of, of NIL deals are going to be, right? That's kind of what the idea was. But I don't know that those are the ones that you sell. You know, they weren't getting the Bryce Young, like million dollar thing or, or whatever it was. That's not, that's not what you saw. Um, and I, I just feels like they're behind in, in just about every aspect. Um, and, you know, from a recruiting perspective, you look at it and, you know, they've recruited well, but they're still not on the level of the Ohio State, um, the Alabama, right? They're not recruiting in that way. It's not close. So now you add another factor that those schools have and you don't, you know, I mean, it's not great. <laughs> so right. Certainly you'd like to see some movement if you're a Penn State fan. Yeah, it, it's it's an uncharted water that Penn State has not even it seems delved into because we didn't hear much after the initial announcement from Penn State specifically of, you know, business center and go get it yourself sort of stuff. Um, I know they're overdue right now. <laughs> When's the latest they can act without being in detriment? And I know that's kind of a vague question, Nate, and I'm kind of trying to put make you pin the tail on a donkey and the donkey is a live donkey running through the backyard of your daughter's yep. party. But yeah. what do you what do you think like the drop dead date for hearing something is? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't th I don't think there's a drop dead. I, I think that these things are always fluid anyway. I, I mean, look, like recruiting moves in cycles that this is the next thing, but there's always a next thing after the next thing. And so it just it just to me is an issue of James Franklin and his staff are have to compete in the recruiting world with things like, Hey, well, you know, our facilities, we've been through that ad nauseum, yeah. but it is what it is, right? Like they're, they're not up to the level of many of the schools that they're competing against. Uh, and so you're, you're selling something else. You're selling development to the NFL. You're selling, um, you know, what the experience is and this is unique and right history, yep. all of those things. That's fine. But if coach a can say to a prospective recruit, Hey, listen, it's not, this isn't a superstar deal. There there's potential for superstar deals, but at minimum, we have the infrastructure in place where our players on average are making $30,000 a year. Okay. In addition to their take home stipend money, you know, cost of attendance, like all of those different things, our players are doing, are have an NIL infrastructure in place and it, it might vary a little bit, but coming in at about, at about $30,000 a year. Yep. If your response is, Hey, we don't have that <laughs> and we're not sure when it's coming and, but we like, let's just not talk about it. That's not a good place to be. That's not, that's not, that's not where you want to be. It, it just, it, it isn't. And, and I understand that, you know, how that might sound, but you just, you, you have to be able to pre pre present something. And I think the fact that this particular recruiting class, right, the class of 2023 or 2022, the one that signed in December, the fact that the rules change happened in July, that was like way down the line in right. terms of how far into the process they were. Uh, I think that it's probably becoming a much bigger deal for the class of 2023, but it's going to be a massive, massive deal for, for the class of 2024, yep. right? Like these, these shifts that, that are starting to take place are going to be not fully realized, but much more formed than they are currently. And so it, it there are going to be very like bottom line propositions for these players and their families to consider. And it's going to be part of the, the transfer portal as well. Right. Is like, I, I, I <laughs> we, we all want to like dip our toes into the new water of what college athletics is. Guess what? It's here. It is surrounding you. It, it is engulfing don't you. Don't drown. And don't drown. Yeah. Don't and drown. It's, to your point, Nate, the, the one thing I noticed that it seems Penn State is pushing 
and I don't mean this in a negative way. I just mean that their message to recruits from, if you go to bluewhiteillustrated.com, sign up for just a dollar, get access to the premium content, the on three plus content, you would have seen all weekend long what the, the quotes from the recruits from junior day and the recruits that were on campus that weren't for junior day or other, you know, players that are considering coming to the program. Penn state is pushing family, uh, education, life after football, and, you know, in certain players' uh, situations, technique and getting to the next level and being a great football player. None of them mentioned NIL. None of them mentioned any of those things. So that's a, you know, maybe James Franklin would always push those things anyway, and it would be a side conversation later. Like, we want to make you, we want you to make this decision for the right reasons, not for money, whatever. But it, it's not even mentioned at all. Dave, I want to throw to you to wrap up this conversation, and then we're going to move on to something else. Do you have any final thoughts on what Penn State needs to do, not only here, but basketball is a big part of this as well, I imagine. Penn State is, you know, theoretically also has a basketball team. Yeah, theoretically. Um, <laughs> I don't yeah, mean I don't that as an insult, but gonna... we're only talking about football with this, and it applies no, everywhere. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know how that's going to impact that basketball, right? Because if you compare the interest, um, certainly it seems like the interest is, you know, smaller here than at other places. So, yeah, I don't know how that translates to NIL. I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, the one thing that I would say is, and again, I'm not – Ryan Snyder, I'm not Greg Pickle, I'm not calling these kids all the time, but you know, in in a couple of the conversations that I have had, you know, and again, this was a while ago, it has been brought up. So I, I do think that they're talking to them about it at the very least a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but yeah, it certainly doesn't seem like there is the same, or it, I, it doesn't seem. I know that there is not the same infrastructure in place uh, as there is other places. So yeah. Uh, Time to move, you know, it's it's time to go here. Uh, didn't want to bring this up right away when we we're talking about a very serious subject and undercut what you guys were saying. But Steven says, hey, here's my contribution to forestall your movement to TikTok. So thank you. I don't want to be doing Frank, I think you would be great at TikTok. Uh, there's a 5% chance I'd be great at it. There's a 40% chance that I would be absolutely terrible at it, and that would make me great at it. So I think I see what you're <laughs> saying, so I appreciate that. Uh, we'll be getting to some of your questions later. Uh, we want I want to talk a little bit quickly about Penn State in the transfer portal because you guys have mentioned that nothing has happened as far as transfers into the program. But Penn State has been offering players over the last week with uh, several defensive ends, including two from uh, from North Texas, Grayson Murphy and Gabriel Murphy. Is th Should this be encouraging? Because this is kind of where I was. I'll just give you my opinion to start. Penn State did not get any players in the transfer portal to start and to enroll in the spring semester. But that doesn't mean that they can't go out and offer players and there can't be movement of names and places and things over the next month or two because guys looking for a new destination are still going to be looking like maybe they didn't make their decision in time maybe they're on a different semester schedule or maybe Penn State was offering guys that they didn't see right away either way I just I, I've seen more movement from situations than I have actually guys committing and being on campus is that an okay distinction or is the window gone and the, the effect you think is still lagging because they missed that December enrollment period, Nate? No, I don't, I don't think the, sh the ship has sailed. I think you want to find the right fits and then you want to, you, you know, like I, I, it's, it's not like there's necessarily a perfect solution out there, but there are multiple solutions that can help fill your needs. And so Penn state, approach in the past and they're going to continue to take a deliberate approach uh but yeah i mean it, at some point between now and june certainly there's going to be movement it's just a matter of um you know they missed on a few in that first wave and mm -hmm. are going to probably you know obviously attempt to to hit on that second wave because here's the other reality the roster that penn state has right now also will not be the same right in in may and so there there will be different needs and other things that need to be addressed so i i don't think that it's a panic situation necessarily it's just hey the these things that 
they tried to fulfill at that stage in December and the earliest stage of January, you know, some of them came to fruition and some of them didn't. And now they're going to need to move forward. Uh, hello back from State College to William. Thanks for joining the show. Appreciate you being a part of the audience. We're going to be getting to your questions here in just a second. Dave, want to wrap up with you on this particular topic when it comes to the transfer portal. What are you, what's your opinion on Penn State's work so far? And have you seen anything or have you read up on the two players that they offered from North Texas? Yeah, um, I know nothing about the two players from North Texas, so I'll defer to you there. <laughs> but uh, can't say I'm watching a lot of mean green football, T. Frank. Uh, You're missing but, out, let me tell you. Am, am I? Am I really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's tough because our first real year of this – was last season yep. and we all know that the calendar was absolutely just nuked it was ruined um so it's tough to know where they're at because there's no baseline and the baseline that we can apply last season is different because the calendar was inherently different the timeline was all messed up right so to me, looking at it, and I compare it to last season, it looks like they're behind because they had several impact players in before the beginning of that semester. Um, but maybe that's not what the norm is going to be. I don't know. Um, obviously, it's good to see them making some some offers, and you know, hopefully that turns into something more concrete. But I guess just looking comparatively, it does look like they're behind to me. Um, but obviously... Again, there's plenty of opportunity. Like like you and Nate said, it's not done. It's not over. There's going to be plenty of names. There's going to be plenty of opportunities to get those impact guys. And it's important that they hit because this roster needs help. It's, yeah. You know, I mean, I think I think everybody knows that. There, there are areas that need to be addressed. So, um, yeah, it's definitely something to watch. So I, I did take a look at um, only some stats and some uh, some numbers from PFF on both of the Murphy twins from North Texas. Uh, 20 hits on the quarterback between them last season, 18 total sacks for the Mean Green. A little undersized from what I can see as far as what their listed weights are, but I think that these are out of date uh, because I believe Gabriel is now up around 255 from what I was reading. So um, there's been some talk that one of them might be a linebacker and one of them might be a defensive end. They both are listed as edge defenders for North Texas. So I think that... That is what I was expecting. Looking at these numbers, looking at these, this profile, both have a an elite pass rushing grade from PFF. That is in the Arnold Ebikidi sort of mold for what they are looking for in the transfer portal. I didn't look at all of the options, but I did not see any uh, any guys that had this profile in the first wave of edge defenders. But I again, because Penn State didn't offer some of them publicly, I did not take a look at them. So I guess that's what I was thinking of just because the story has not been written yet and kind of in the same conversation of NIL, just because we haven't seen it, just we haven't heard it doesn't mean there isn't a plan in action. I would say there's more of a plan in action with the transfer portal than NIL though. So we're, well, we're going to leave it. Go ahead, Nate. Well, no, you're just, you're missing one, one part, which is to, to actively recruit the guys who aren't in the portal yet. Right. <laughs> right. Which that's uh, that's that's uh, kind of the sticking point, huh? I guess it's against the rules, but uh, you know, whatever. Oh, those morals getting in the way again. Uh, so this is going to be our section here for. We, normally, we take questions throughout the show, but because I want to do something a little bit different, we're going to be getting audience participation during our. I'll call it a game, but it's it's going to be you're going to be deciding who's the winner here, and then the winner has to be uh, or the losers have to be shamed in our little competition coming up next. So we're going to answer your questions right now here on the BWI live show. Let's start with the first one in the chat. I think this is a common question from uh, McCarmen here. I think that it is. Why doesn't Christian Veyu get a chance? Comes and plays well. Uh, what is he missing? not to be considered is it missing throws in practice or not knowing the complete playbook guys it's so much more than that isn't it Nate this is this has been our conversation last year leading up to when he replaced Taquan Roberson as the number two yeah I, well who says that he hasn't like who says that he won't uh 
Right. I, I don't know. I, I, I remain, uh, and, and trust me, I get it. I, I understand the way that it looks and what the assumption is. But if Christian Veyu is way better than everybody else on the roster, he'll play. <laughs> like, like that's right. it. It is. It. 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 I, I don't have any question that experience and seniority and um you know a a track record all play into coaching decisions of who plays and who doesn't like that is the case at every position on the field however if you can demonstrate clearly and these things are tracked right these, there are stats they, they, it's through practice it's it makes it so that the decision itself isn't all that complicated. If you come out and you complete 70% of your passes in practice against the the one defense versus whoever, Drew Alar, uh, Bo Pribula, Sean Clifford, they're 55%, he will start. He will play. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I think that, that last year was such a... a, a a bad circumstance for Penn State at the quarterback position. They just didn't have the time necessarily to have anyone more ready than what they had. Right. Um, right. Can I, can I stop so, yeah, you there? No. Yeah, go ahead. I, I want to ask Dave this. Do you think that where would have the, where would the opportunity have been to play Christian Veyu more? Uh, what to say he doesn't get a chance where do you think are reasonable places that he could have gotten a chance to play during the season last year? Um, to me, and and again, I this isn't what I think, but I guess by virtue, to just to answer your question, maybe Illinois, right? Right. Um, Sean Clifford is hurt, very clearly in, in, impaired by his injury, um, and, and Penn State, I think, loses that game because of that. Um, but, you know... Um, we didn't know that what Christian Veyu was at that time, right? And I don't think Penn State did it did either. It was, you know, two or three weeks later against Rutgers, which again, let's let's relax a little bit because it's Rutgers, okay? Um, he has a, a decent game. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, the 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 most the most popular guy on the team is the backup quarterback, unless you've got like Justin Fields at Ohio State or something. You know what I mean? It's just, it's inevitable. Yeah, People I was going to say, be, to replace be careful because C.J. Stroud you know? for a little bit, well, they, were, they were saying maybe he needs to sit for a little bit this year. So, <laughs> and then he does what he does for the rest of the season. Uh, I, I, that's what I would say is the only time that I think that there was a, a case to put um, Christian Veyu in the game, and I see somebody says the Michigan State game, Sean Clifford played well in that game, especially it was one of his was best games, especially late in the game in the bowl game. I would say you could have made the 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 argument that the fourth quarter should have been values or we no. should have seen him at some point during the game because it's the bowl game. And you were moving guys around for their what we are projecting their future positions next year from Juice Scruggs and from uh, from Curtis Jacobs. So you could just say, like, we want to see some guys. This has nothing to do with uh, Sean Clifford coming back or not. But because Sean Clifford made the announcement he was coming back, that solidified him as the starter in the bowl game. And to open it up would have caused, I think, some of the issues that they didn't want. So I understand why they, they didn't, but it, it became obvious late in that game that Sean Clifford was not effective, and I would have I would have seen what I had from my backup a little bit earlier in that game. But don't forget, they probably made that decision, and then Arkansas went on an eight-minute drive. So there's also that. John asks, what does next year's linebacker group look like, and is it the most concerning group on defense? I'm going to let you guys answer that part, because I think we can have a discussion about that. Over at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com uh, on Saturday, I wrote uh, the possible lineups and combinations that you can see based on the roster for 2022. So if you want to check that out, BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. This is a great uh, time to talk about that where you can sign up for just $1 and you can get access to 12 months of content from Blue White Illustrated. And if you do that and you sign up and subscribe to the, the YouTube channel, it costs you exactly $1. 
So it's a great package deal we got for you here at Blue White Illustrated. Guys, is it the most concerning group on defense in your mind, Dave? Yeah, probably. Um, I don't know. I think, honestly, the defensive line is is pretty close. Yeah. It might be a little bit yeah. of a coin flip. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I might lean towards linebacker just because you don't know what you have, right? Uh, you know, you know Curtis Jacobs is is – is good enough and you, you hope that he takes, takes another step. But outside of that, I mean, you know, Charlie Catcher, Jonathan Sutherland, Kobe King, Jamari Budden, maybe a true freshman, maybe Tyler Elsden. I don't know. Um, and I don't feel like I know who any of those guys are at the moment, maybe with the exception of, of Catcher. Um, but yeah, it's, it feels like there's variables there. Um, and if the variables don't go Penn State's way, then it could be a problem. So, yeah, that, that I think that would be where I would lean at the moment. Nate, give us your take. We need a All right. take. I got a, ta- I got a take, and it's a hot one, so oh. be prepared. Yeah, yeah. I'll follow up uh, with a give. How about that? Okay. Uh, I think that if you're concerned about linebackers, that is the conservative thing approach right and and what i mean by that is penn state needs defensively to have an offensive mindset it needs to make plays it needs to change the outcome of the game and so if like linebacker play being average middling is not going to win you any games and it's not gonna lose you any games or it shouldn't lose you any games uh not having a defensive end who can consistently get to the quarterback and strip sacks and do game changing plays that will lose you games because it's not going to win you games. So, um, yeah, no, that, I mean, to me, that should be the most concerning. That should be the most concerning part of the defense is whether or not the defense has a defensive end who can get to the quarterback and do it consistently and blow things up. Yeah. Linebackers will line. So I have a hard time with this because we are shifting and de-emphasizing certain positions in football, but other teams, I think if you watch the uh, NFC championship game last night, and actually this proves your point, Nate, uh, Troy reader, former Penn state recruit was bad in that game because he is a specific type of football player for the Rams. He is their one run stopper. He and Greg Gaines are the guys that are focused on the run. The entire rest of the team is focused on stopping the pass and getting penetration plays like you just talked about from the defensive line. So, linebacker, you can manage having an average group. If you have superstars there, then great. You're going to have an elite defense. But you're right. Focusing on positions that make bigger impacts consistently, especially positions that don't have to be wrong every time, between RPOs and read options and players in space, linebackers... There's a lot that they just can't get right because everything's designed to pick on the linebacker. So how do you manage that? Well, maybe you worry about other things and you take away the problem before it even starts. I think that's a valid argument, but you can't sway so far away from it that you then uh, have a hole. Because just like running back, I think we've seen teams that when you have a hole on your roster, that does become a problem. So Robert asks, why does everyone forget about Adisa Isaac? He should be ready to go this spring. Nate, you just talked about a pass rushing defensive end. Quickly yep. give us, why are we forgetting about Adisa Isaac? I, not forgetting, just don't know, right? I, you know, look, anybody coming off of an injury that keeps them out for a whole year, whether or not they're back at 100% the next season is always going to be in doubt until they actually do it. So it's not it's not a knock on him, and it's, and it's, it's, um, it's just setting the right expectations, which is, right. hey, if, if he comes back and he's awesome, then that's a bonus. That's great for Penn State. But if you have the opportunity to bring in somebody like Arnold Abichetti, who, look, <laughs> like he almost won the Michigan game for them. Like that, his sack and fumble would have won the game if Penn State had any semblance of an offense. So, um, no, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I just think that there there's this there's this like divergence or this separation in thought processes 
which is, are you looking to avoid the worst case scenario, right? Like defensively, are you just trying to stop, you know, make sure that teams don't um, consistently move up and down the field on you? Or are you trying to create a defense that will take the ball away and give your offense more possessions? Uh, And so like, I think that Penn State wants to have an attitude of aggression defensively uh, and getting there demands players who step up and make plays in the biggest moments of the game. Uh, and and sometimes they've had it, and sometimes when they don't, it becomes very, very noticeable. Yeah, and that that is actually very valid as far as playmakers on defense, and, and typically those guys don't play Mike linebacker. Your Mike linebacker is a stable Correct. part of a unit that spins around it and makes plays. Uh, so we got a couple more seconds here for uh, some questions. Want to make sure we get everyone's question before we move on. Uh, Night Raven has a comment, and he says, I am concerned about the whole team. That is one way to do it. <laughs> that is one way to go about life is to be concerned about the whole team. Uh, but it's there aren't a ton of sure things coming back. Even from the play in 2022 or 2021, you're projecting that certain players and positions are getting better. There aren't a lot of locks coming back. So, I, I mean, is that fair? I know I'm, I'm poking a little fun at Night Raven, who's one of our regulars, but Dave, is that fair to, to be concerned about the whole team? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, they just had a subpar, I think, season by almost anyone's estimation, and they are losing a lot of the best aspects of that team. So, yeah, I think that's <laughs> totally valid. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a take, to be honest. I think that's just, you know, how it is all right well let's move on let's get to what we're going to be doing here today we are doing 2022 predictions for penn state football and here's how this is going to work we are going to go through and we're going to give a topic let's say penn state is good or bad next season and then each of us is going to give our answer and then you in the chat are going to vote who's the winner Okay, so here's here how here we go. Let's start with our first one. Penn State wins more games this season if Dave says the Penn State offensive line improves, Auburn stinks, and the running game improves. <laughs> kind of backing up what you just said there, Dave. Uh, Nate says Michigan and Michigan State take steps back. Minnesota Northwestern at home are significantly easier than Iowa and Wisconsin on the road. And I said Olaf Ashanu and Landon Tangwall are all Big Ten caliber offensive linemen. So while you're voting. In the chat, you got to throw in which name you think is right. Uh, Dave, take me through your point. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, the offensive line was awful. <laughs> it, it needs to be better. Um, you know, similarly, the running game was awful. <laughs> it needs to be better. Um, they got absolutely nothing exclo- explosive from their running game in 2021. If that continues they won't be better. But if it does, I mean, you know, I, that you were, it's, I'm, I'm kind of skewing this to the, to the negative aspect, but I guess the other way to look at it is there's a ton of, uh, ton of room for positive improvement. Right. So certainly that's an area where they can do that. Uh, Nate, Michigan and Michigan state take steps back. You're looking at the winnable games on the schedule next year. So take us through your thought process there. Yeah. I, well, I just, there's, there's always two parts of the equation when making projections. One is what happens to Penn State, but the area that always gets overlooked is what happens to everybody else. And so I think that when everyone was projecting games for the 2021 season, there were assumptions made about a two and four Michigan team and a three and nine Michigan State team coming back or not three and nine, but you know what I mean? Michigan yeah. state stunk. Yep. <laughs> they were terrible. So, right. Like that, that has to be part of the equation is what, what, what is going to happen at Michigan? What's going to happen with Jim Harbaugh uh, and his staff? He's already lost his defensive coordinator. So what, what takes, what takes place at those places um, will have a big impact on Penn state because the reality was Penn state was, uh, I what was the number? Twenty one points in the five losses during the regular season, right? Like so, that was what. Se- it wasn't as though Penn State was uncompetitive in most of its losses, um. And so, if if that's where you're at, which is just on the underside 
of a lot of those games. Like if they were getting blown out, maybe it would be a different conversation of, oh, Penn State has vast improvements that need to happen for it to get back into being competitive. I don't think that's the case. I think it's just a matter of, hey, can, if if Penn State largely stays the same, right? Offense takes a step forward, defense takes a step back, but otherwise maybe ends in the same similar place, what happens? And to me, what happens is going to be dictated a lot by how those other programs uh, progress this offseason. Yeah. Uh, so this is going to be a bit of a theme for me throughout some of our, our answers here and some of the things we talk about. If Penn State doesn't find more ways to win next season, they're not going to be a good football team offensively. You'll get more of the same in what Nate just said. So the guys that are different next season are Olufashanu and Landon Tangwell, who we don't have a lot of information about. So if those guys are really good, Penn State has new avenues to win. Presumably the offensive line will be better because of those two players, and maybe there's less weak points secondarily that makes the everything else just work better on on the offense with as something we're going to get to a little bit later i don't want to spoil all the fun so that's why i'll leave that off and the runaway winner by the way nate you take round one in a landslide so congratulations for your <laughs> practicality i want to keep doing this yeah. There you go. Woo. You're the winner. Okay, so our next topic of conversation is Penn State and how they'll be worse. Uh, that's the same one. Penn State and they'll lose more games this year. Sorry, they all look the same in the little program I'm using. So we're going to start with, let's hopefully I can get the right one here. The offense doesn't score many, uh, doesn't score many, many more points. Bottom line, says Nate. Dave says... Defense won't be as good, so they have to score points. And I said Sean Clifford is asked to do everything again. So, Nate, you just went your winner. You start off round one. Give me your 60-second elevator pitch about your particular point. They can't average 21 points a game. It's a non-starter. It's a non-starter. If, if Penn State finishes the season in that vicinity for points scored, offensively every game they're going to lose more games than they did this year. It doesn't matter what everyone else does because everyone else, regardless of the opponent is going to score 24 points. <laughs> so like that's, that's it is uh, if, if Penn state cannot find a way to increase its offensive, like, and not, not production because the yards and the passing yards, uh, the, obviously the running game was abysmal, but, Generally speaking, moving the ball wasn't a massive downfall. It was the fact that once they got into the red zone and, and fringe red zone, they couldn't score and they didn't have explosive plays. So those two factors were, were too much for them to overcome. Has to change. More touchdowns, less field goals, fewer field goals attempted, win more games. Dave, 60 seconds. Let's go. Give me why why you agree with Nate, but you're better than him. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll look at it from the defensive point of view, right? I mean, look at the names that aren't going to be there next season. Uh, Jaquan Brisker, you know, one of the best one of the best safeties in college football. Um, Arnold Ebicady, all Big Ten first team defensive end. Brandon Smith, Ellis Brooks, Derek Tangelo. We don't know if P.J. Mustafer is going to be the same. To recaster fields, right? These are all very good players. And if you look at how Penn State won last season, it was defense, please save us. Save us, save us, save us. Defense, allow like zero points inside the red zone magically all season. Defense, get takeaways to right. set up. The, you know what I mean? That's That was the formula. So with all of this star power no longer available and a new defensive coordinator who is going to be working in Penn State in his first season. Um what I, I don't I don't know what the pathway is unless the offense carries its weight a little bit more. I, I I don't I don't know I don't know what the formula is for Penn State to win football games. Um maybe maybe everybody that steps up is great. Um but I think counting on that would be a mistake. 
Um, so yeah, the offense has got to get better, period. So I'm going to go with a, a follow-up to my previous thought that Sean Clifford can't be asked to do everything again. It is about finding multiple ways to succeed and not putting everything on your quarterback's shoulders. That could work when you have great quarterbacks. And I think we focus on those guys because they are a bandage for the way things break in football. Offensive line isn't great. The quarterback can throw quickly or can scramble. The receiver doesn't quite get open. The quarterback can throw an absolute dime into uh, coverage and put it in the only spot that the receiver can catch. The running game doesn't work. The quarterback can be a part of the running game. We've seen examples of this, and we can see what great quarterbacks do. But if you don't have one of those guys, you have to be really good at football, 360 in every single direction. So Sean Clifford is a good quarterback that can win games for you in the right situation, but the situation requires a Journey Brown ripping off big runs. It requires a uh, receiving core that gets big plays and scores touchdowns on those plays and doesn't just get 70 yards. So, or, or Sorry, 40 yards. 70 would get you a touchdown. So those are the things I think that have to happen next season or Penn State will lose more games. So Sean Clifford being the star again, you know, that to me, I think, is going to be a problem. All right. So our winner this round, again, with a pretty consistent voting uh, base is Dave Eckert, our winner. Congratulations, Dave. It is tied wow. now. This he, is, he took so it, he, his he said the same thing as me. How's that possible? I don't know. Yeah, man. But I explained it. I explained it more passionately. <laughs> so I win. <laughs> so congratulations. You get the uh, second uh, round here, uh, and I'm going to take myself out of running so that we can have a winner. So it's between Nate and Dave for round three. Finally, Penn State will stay the same if, and let's hope to the Lord I can find the right ones. Dave says Penn State's offense continues to lack explosion. Nate says the quarterback position, however it shakes out, remains inconsistent. Can't be break-even position. Has to be difference-making. Okay, so Dave, let's go to you again. I'm going to put you on screen for your final thoughts. Let's wrap this baby up. You give me your thoughts of what uh, Penn State stays the same if. I feel like I'm around the horn right now. Um but but yeah, you know, it's 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 the offense and whether or not they can generate those big plays. I think Nate and I are kind of saying the same thing different ways here. Um, you know, you look at how Penn State moved the ball down the field last season. It was plotting. It was slow. It was, OK, we need to do the right thing 10 times instead of doing the awesome thing once, you know, um, and, and they're they're losing the one guy who did the awesome thing for them occasionally, and that was Jahan Dotson. So <laughs> if 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 occasionally Penn State cannot break off that big play, if Keandre Lambert Smith, if Parker Washington, if Nick Singleton or whoever can't be that guy, and Penn State cannot occasionally just take the pressure off itself, take itself out of the blender and just get the big play instead of having to do the right thing repeatedly just to get down the field, which to me is not a reasonable ask of college football players. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't see how it's any different. So that, that to me is the, the big, uh, the, the big thing that needs to happen. All right, Nate, your response, the quarterback position go. Yeah, but I, 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 I'm declaring Dave the winner already. Cause I think that was a perfect answer. Uh, <laughs> I'll still talk about the quarterback. Come on, Nate. It's about competition. But but to to Dave's point, that's right, is Penn State was made to do what Penn State's defense does to everyone else. Right? Like, that's the strategy that Penn State takes to every game that it has is make make offenses do that. And it happened to them this season, and there was nothing they could do about it. So I think that's a tremendous point, Dave. Excellent. However, for what it's worth, <laughs> yeah, the quarter, the quarterback position has to change the game. And uh, it didn't do that this year uh, at all, really. Right. I mean, even yeah. the, even in the, even in the Wisconsin game, right? Like, so they had now I, I, Clifford was good against Auburn. And I think that has to count for something, but it, it just, whether it's him or whether it's somebody else, what, what, whatever, what have you, there, there are five plays a game that that position has to make key first downs, uh, com completed, you know, like 
making the pass, the wide open pass in the end zone, deep downfield, uh, you, you have to make that pass. You have to connect on that. And so if that position cannot fulfill that, you're just going to see the same retread of close games. Penn State has enough talent to stay close with just about everybody. Yep. I, at least I think, right? Like they have they have the talent to be in the game, but it's not enough to win the game consistently without that position being a difference maker. I'm going to give uh, an answer to a different question we had earlier in the chat about the quarterback position that I think ties in here. And I also want to give everyone uh, one more chance to vote because you didn't have as much time on this one. But Steven asks, going back to our question about Christian Veyu playing at some point in the season and not playing against Villanova. And JC brought this up. I didn't quite understand what he's trying to say during our question segment, so I wanted to make sure we got to this. JC asks about game management and depth chart management during games early in the season, about the quarterback and when you go to the bench. So, with this particular situation this season, I think you both make great points. I think you both would be right if it weren't the first season you were trying to get Sean Clifford up to speed and to make it so that this offense was ready to compete in the in in the conference season. And I know they started off with conference season, but plowing as many reps into your starter as possible. So when they weren't just beating the doors off of teams early in the season, they elected to keep working on their game. Use that as a an extra practice against Villanova or in some of those early season games. But JC does make a point that in this particular season Penn State was pretty slow to go to the bench to get any real uh, production out of those guys or to see guys play. It was the same thing on defense. The linebackers, we didn't see anything from these young guys in any meaningful situation, which tells you something about what the, the staff thought of them this season, that they, they, were, they know the future. They probably knew these players were going to be in line to start in 2022, but they wanted to make sure they didn't feel like they had earned those reps on the field yet. So I think there's a little bit of that going on as far as wanting to make sure you won the games this year and also getting the team on offense specifically ready to go for uh, late in the season in those meaningful games that you uh, had to win. And ultimately they didn't. So their gamble did not pay off. And Dave, I don't know if I want to give this to you because it was kind of a cop out, but you are the winner both in the chat oh. and because uh, Nate gave up and said you had their answer anyway. So. <laughs> Yeah, but congratulations. No, I got a tie. no, there's a tie. It's a tie. Well, I'm the tiebreaker, Nate, and I'm calling oh. Dave the winner. Also, this we've got seven factor. minutes and we need to get to basketball. So I wanted to give some opportunity to talk about Penn State basketball coming up tonight. You can follow both of these guys on Twitter uh, at Nate Bauer BWI and at David Eckert 98. I don't have it up here. Hold on. There it is. You so you can it. follow yep. them on Twitter or you can join the Lions and message board to have a conversation with them during the game. Penn State and Iowa playing tonight at the Bryce Jordan Center tip off at seven. Guys, this has been a rough road in January for Penn State starting out so promising. Dave, you were our winner. You get bragging rights to go first. What happened this past month? Bad offense, T. Frank. <laughs> I mean, just very bad offense. Just very, very bad offense. Um, yeah, you know, uh, they can't score points. <laughs> uh, they're not making their shots. Uh, they're not getting good looks. And, you know, the difference, and, and, and I think part of this is Michael Shrewsbury wanting to keep these games stiff and slow because that's how you stay in games um, when you have less talent than the other team. But they don't get transition baskets yeah. because they don't want to because they want to move slowly because they want to stay in the game. So it, it kind of works against them and for them at the same time. Um, but yeah, man, they just, I, they're not scoring. Uh, John Hera hasn't been great lately. Um, Greg Lee hasn't been very good. They're not really getting, getting, you know, additional scoring from their guards outside of Jalen Pickett. Seth Lundy hasn't been very good. They're not making threes. Like, it's just you name it. It's not happening. Um, it's It's been an ugly offensive stretch for sure. You wrote, Nate, about what Michael Shrewsbury said after the last performance, which was not good. Um, he, a, a stern warning to his team. What that was did, me. 
I said that. Oh, okay. All right. All right. That was the way you nutshelled it. So yeah. tell us what he said and your takeaway from that, please. Yeah. So uh, he said that if you don't play, I'm paraphrasing, if you don't play hard, you're not going to play. Um, uh, quote, it's, uh, it's just all about finding the right guys who are going to go out there and fight and compete. It's what we did at halftime. We're only going to play the guys that are going to fight and compete from here on out. That's it. That's who we want to be. The emphasis was mine. But um, no, I, I think that you saw Greg Lee disappear in the second half of that game. I think you saw Giovanni Scott disappear. You saw Jelani White disappear. Uh, and that was message sending to those guys, but to everyone else, that if your effort is not there, uh, the minutes will also not be there. And, so you know, like, I, I think that, Yes, they're in a little bit of a funk offensively. Uh, the one thing I'll disagree with Dave about is in the first half, uh, they missed 20 shots, right, against Indiana. Half of those were great looks. They were easy jump shots that you, at this level, uh, someone told me this a long time ago, at this level, the difference is making that open shot is like, <laughs> you have to do that. That yeah. is what you do. Uh, if it's been, you've got to put it down. And they didn't. And so, you know, the 29-point game at halftime could have easily been 12. And 12 is not where you want to be, but it's manageable. You've seen plenty um, of 12-point so games at halftime that have become competitive in the final five minutes, for sure. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah, they correct. played pretty so well in the second half, too. So, you know, yeah. I mean, if that's a manageable game at halftime, you don't know how that turns out. So, yep. Nate, it, it sounds like there's the threat, and, and you didn't say that it sounds like if you don't play hard, you don't play. Does Penn State I, – I have a hard time with that because it's not like they have a ton of players where right. if somebody isn't playing hard, <laughs> you can just sit somebody to make a point. And, and, and Monty Shrewsbury has done that with Sam Sessoms already this year. But can you afford to do that and then be in games? Like, it seems like that is a very fine line to, to walk. Dave, do you think that's a fair uh, statement, or do you think that – it doesn't matter and that the effort is what's going to get you the win if you're Penn State. Penn State is not going to win basketball games against the vast majority of the remaining opponents on its schedule with its talent alone. Um, I don't think really that's news to, to anybody who knows kind of the roster that Penn State has here. And, and look, they have some players, right? But it's not... You know, like this, this, this is a team that has to be greater than the sum of its parts. And part of that is effort. So if you're not getting that, then yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of support uh, sending that message. And, and, and look, that game was over, T. Frank, right? That game was beyond finished. That game was over five minutes in. So, you know, if, if Micah Shrewsbury wants to, to take the second half of that game to send a message, by all means. Um, maybe he doesn't do that if it's a five-point game at halftime. I right. don't know. Maybe he just, you know, tells them off. So and, to, and, to your point, and, if it's a five-point game at halftime, they're probably trying harder because both right. both elements need to be yeah. there for this team to be in games. So let's talk about the game tonight with Iowa. They already lost on the road to Iowa as part of this January slide of only road games with the Minnesota game postponed because of COVID. Um, what happened the last time around, Nate, between these two teams. So give us a set, set the scene for the last time we saw them together. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a little bit of the, the same thing that happened in the first half against Indiana in that, look, miss, miss shots dictate effort. Sometimes they do. And uh, Penn State had this massive rebounding advantage in the first half against Iowa. Um, they, they, Penn State wasn't playing great but they weren't playing poorly and it really limited after a hot start for Iowa, what Iowa was doing offensively. Like Iowa just didn't score many points, but neither did Penn state in this big stretch of the first half. Uh, and then in the second half, Iowa got hot and Penn state couldn't, couldn't keep up offensively, but also started giving up second chance points, giving up offensive rebounds um, and ended up losing the rebounding battle uh, in that game, which was remarkable given the advantage that they had in the first half. So now it's, it's it, look, they have not played at home 
at the Bryce Jordan Center in a long, long time. And so getting back home, making some shots, which you predict and will assume should happen a little more on your home nets, uh, sh- should be able to to at least change the balance of competitiveness in a game like this. Is this a game that Penn State can win, Dave? Because I know we, we yeah. go into games knowing that this team is going to be outmatched talent-wise. Is this one that Penn State can go in? If they get that effort, they get that execution, can they win this game? Definitely, yeah. Um, I think I think Vegas has them as like a four-point dog. You know, I mean, that's not nothing, nothing crazy. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a it's a game they could win. Um, I think Penn State will feel like it kind of needs to win its home games um, if it wants to make something of this season. So because they have not been good on the road. They mm-hmm. had, you know, the, the they, they beat Northwestern on the road. But other than that, the road has been very difficult for them. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think this is a game that they can win. I think this is a game that they're going to feel like they, they might have to. Um, so, yeah, uh, we'll see what happens. You know, they were in that game in Iowa City. Um, they t- despite turning the ball over like every other time they touched it. So, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it, it's, it's a game they can win if they clean some things up. Uh, final 60 seconds here, guys. Anything about the game that we didn't touch on that you want to talk about? Nate, we'll start with you. Anything, any last thoughts about tonight's game against Iowa? No, but I do want to give lip service to the Iowa uh, wrestling win. There, there's some comments about it. Good for wrestling. Way to go. <laughs> Two. Two yeah, we actually we will, be, we will be covering. Thank you for bringing that up. I'll just throw this in here right now uh, because that is a great question to ask. Ah, whatever. We can talk about it. We talk about that on the BWI Daily Edition with Greg Pickle coming up at four o'clock today. We break down the win over Iowa and what's coming up for this team. And once again, kind of taking a big picture look at that at the uh, at the Penn State wrestling team, which is once again steamrolling its way towards the NCAA championships. One of the more complete teams we've seen according to Greg so Dave last thoughts from you yeah I, you know I'm I'm very happy that I absolutely destroyed Nate in our contest <laughs> here even though he let me win um but you know I'm I'm looking forward to some shooty hoops and yeah it's gonna be fun well good news for you uh M Shive 2 as soon as I hit the end button here this will go up for replay on YouTube so you can check out the BWI live show on replay uh I think immediately after the show's over so let's get to that right now I'm your host Thomas Frank Carr don't forget follow these guys on uh Twitter for the game tonight Nate Bauer BWI and David Eckert 98 for your Penn State hoops knowledge tonight I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr, BWI Live Monday at noon every week this offseason. We'll talk to you then.